My father passed away, and a year has passed since then. After the death of my father, my mother was also engulfed in deep sorrow, but recently, she has finally begun to smile again and her former vitality is returning. One day, as we were regaining our tranquility, my husband's unilateral action threw our household into chaos. Your mother approved, so it should be fine, my husband said, but I counted. How can you think there's no problem? This is our home. Why sacrifice our family to accommodate yours? Unbeknownst to me, my husband had invited his parents, who were living with his brother and his wife, to our home. Moreover, my father's room, which had been left untouched, was tidied up without my consent. With my husband speaking his mind freely and his inconsiderate parents, our home became uncomfortable. Because of this situation, my mother began to go out more often. I cannot accept this situation under any circumstances. I must get my in-laws out of our house. This is a story about the crisis of my home being taken over by my husband and his family after my father's death. My name is Wendy. I am turning 40 this year. I married Greg when I was 28, and I have a medical condition that makes it difficult for me to work outside. Although I used to work full-time when I was younger, my intermittent health issues often caused inconvenience to others, so I later switched to working from home. However, my income is dependent on my health and is unstable every month. Thus, living alone was not a viable option for me. Before marriage, I lived with my working parents, helping with household chores while working. After marrying Greg, we started a new life in a rented apartment, saving money gradually with plans to eventually buy our own home. However, our situation changed when I heard that Greg's brother had built a two-generation house to live with his parents. My parents suggested that we live with my parents in their renovated family home. They were concerned about my unstable income and the difficulty of buying a house just for the two of us. While my parents' proposal was reassuring, living with his wife's family was not easy for Greg. With this in mind, I planned to respect Greg's wishes. But he was excited about the idea of my parents providing all the funds and readily accepted the suggested living arrangement. For about 10 years, the four of us lived relatively harmoniously. Despite my father's strictness, my cheerful husband was always considerate around him and my parents tried not to interfere too much, allowing Greg to relax when not with the family. Despite my unstable income and physical inability to have children, my husband and I lived without major conflicts, supporting each other thanks to my parents' help. I am determined to repay this kindness. Out of gratitude, I acquired a qualification anticipating future caregiving needs, but my father passed away suddenly from a heart attack before I could use it. My mother couldn't accept the reality of this sudden event, lost her appetite, and was unstable for a while. During that time, I focused on supporting my mother, but Greg's behavior began to change. After the renovation was carried out 10 years ago, my family home changed from two stories to three. The first floor had a bedroom and toilet exclusively for my parents, and the spare room became my father's office space. The second floor housed the kitchen, laundry space, and bathroom shared by the whole family, but the living space next to the kitchen was mainly used by my parents. The third floor was reserved for us, with a toilet and two rooms for our use, serving as a living area and bedroom. Normally, we spent our time on the third floor, living our lives there. However, after my father's death, Greg started spending time on the second floor for some reason. Why are you watching TV here? This is my mom's area. Despite my repeated reminders, Greg retorted, if your mother comes, I'll move. She's not here now, so it's fine to use it, and continued to occupy the space. He began to relax in the second floor living room daily, occasionally drinking and falling asleep there. He said he would yield if my mother asked, but she became reticent and stopped coming to the second floor when she knew Greg was there. No matter how much I talked to him, Greg wouldn't listen to me, and after my father's absence, he began to act selfishly, leading to frequent clashes between us. Our conversations dwindled, and then the worst happened. My father passed away, and a year has passed since then. Immediately after my father's death, my mother was also engulfed in deep sorrow, but recently, she has finally begun to smile again, and her former vitality is returning. Huh? What's with this luggage? However, one night, when my mother and I returned from shopping, the storeroom on the first floor was wide open, and all the belongings from my father's study had disappeared. In their place, an unfamiliar old chest of drawers and bed had been set up, and there were mountains of cardboard boxes. To investigate the reason behind these changes, I rushed to the living room on the second floor, where not only Greg but also my mother-in-law were present, and my father-in-law was drinking with Greg. When I called Greg out to the hallway to ask him what was going on, he said, My mom isn't getting along with my brother's wife, so I had no choice but to invite them here. 
I decided to let them use the storeroom. The response I got was more self-centered than usual. Why didn't you tell me? We haven't been talking much lately, and if we did, it would just start a fight. He said that, justifying his lack of consultation because our relationship had cooled off. Where are my dad's belongings? You didn't throw them away, did you? Yes, I threw them away. They were just in the way. Without a word to us, Greg had disposed of my father's items. I couldn't hide my anger at his actions, yelling loud enough for my in-laws and mother to hear. Tell them to leave immediately. Okay. Bring back everything you threw away. All right. Despite my anger, Greg responded calmly, nodding but unlikely to take any action. Whenever a fight broke out, he would just say something to settle things. Listen to me, please. Wendy. As I raised my voice in frustration, I heard a voice from behind. Turning around, I saw my mother coming up the stairs, quietly signaling with her finger to her lips and shaking her head. It's late, let them stay tonight, she said, choosing to be considerate of my in-laws. Later, even when I tried to talk to Greg, he avoided the conversation, using his parents as an excuse. The next morning, while I was reminiscing about my father, Greg passed out drunk in the living room. The table was cluttered with dirty dishes, adding to my frustration. As I was about to start doing the laundry to avoid cleaning up, my mother-in-law threw some laundry at me, saying, Wendy, can you take care of this too? Wendy, you are wonderful. Not only do you wash for your own family, but you also take care of your parents' laundry. Amy only takes care of her own family, she complained, naturally expecting me to do the laundry and expressing dissatisfaction with Greg's brother's wife. Does she really intend to live here? This is the house that my parents built. After my mother-in-law left, I tried to wake up Greg, who was sleeping in the living room, but he was groggy and wouldn't wake up. Eventually, I returned to the bedroom on the third floor and called Greg's brother. Yeah, I've heard about it from Greg. You told me he informed you, but I was not aware of any of this. This is the Owen family house, so it's difficult for the Anderson family members to live here. Please, come and take them back. Handing over the laundry, I felt a sense of urgency. If I didn't act quickly, they would end up staying longer. I requested they be picked up, but Greg's brother immediately replied, I've told Greg as well, but it seems the relationship between Amy and our mother is beyond repair and it looks like our mother doesn't want to live here either. That's, I'm sorry, but you'll have to manage. Wait, just a minute. Ignoring my words, he unilaterally pushed the responsibility onto me, cutting off the conversation. Both brothers were beyond my control. Despite my concerns, I headed back to the second floor where Greg was. Mom. My mother was in the living room, tidying up the messy room even though she had just woken up. I'll clean up here, so mom, please go wash your face. I should have left it to Greg, but in the end, I had to handle it myself. While my mother was in the washroom, I was doing the dishes when I realized Greg had woken up and was opening the refrigerator behind me. I drained the water and immediately resumed the conversation. Did you really get rid of dad's belongings? I asked, to which Greg replied, How many times do I have to say it? Yes, I threw them away. Without consulting us. How can you do such a thing without involving us, the family? I protested. Because unused things are in the way, he said. Is this really a difference of opinion? Or is it influenced by his relationship with his father-in-law? My mother and I wanted to keep my father's belongings a bit longer, but Greg easily let go of them. It feels like no matter how much we talk, he won't understand. I had almost given up on expecting anything from Greg, but imagining my mother being sad again leaves me endlessly troubled. I've advised you not to throw away other people's things without permission, but Greg remained indifferent and gave no response. And I called your brother, I said, to which Greg turned around in surprise and asked, why? I asked him to come pick them up. This is our family's home, so it's impossible for us to live together with your parents. Well, he said. The moment I relayed the conversation with his brother, a deep frown formed on Greg's forehead, and he raised his voice, are you belittling my parents? I clearly stated that there's nowhere else for them to go. Overwhelmed by his angry words, I reflexively counted, you say there's nowhere to go, but isn't your brother's house an option? Why not choose that? However, Greg calmly yet firmly replied, they can't go back there. To which I responded, then, they should find another place. This house was built by my parents. But Greg didn't listen and cut off the conversation midway, leaving the room. As he was leaving, he let slip. You always emphasize it's your parents' house, but don't forget, it's also my home. His words were true. This house was undoubtedly a place for Greg as well. If I continued to insist it's solely my parents' house, it might make Greg uncomfortable. However, despite bringing up the subject of rent in the past, my parents have always refused to accept it. 
You'll have to maintain this house on your own eventually, they said, insisting on saving the money instead. Remembering this, I feel strongly that now is the time to consider my mother's feelings first. How to convey and deal with this to prevent Greg's free actions from disturbing our family peace and get him to understand our position was a deep concern. When I was preoccupied with my concerns about Greg, my mother came back to the living room upstairs. She might have heard our exchange near the stairs. Then, my mother began to express her opinion to me. If they have nowhere else to go, they can stay here until they find a place. Greg's parents are also your family, she said. See, even your mother understands, Greg said confidently. I was irritated by his attitude but decided to accept my mother's suggestion. But you have to look for a new place to live, I stressed to Greg. Okay, okay, he replied ambiguously. I was not sure if they would truly look for a place to live, but I was determined to make sure they keep this promise. Three days later, an unexpected phone call excited me. Is that really true? I exclaimed on the phone. Unable to give up on my father's discarded items. I had contacted a junk removal service to ask if they were stored. The call confirmed that my father's belongings were safely stored. I quickly hung up and contacted a storage company I had researched earlier. While my in-laws were staying at our house, I arranged to store my father's belongings at that warehouse. Before picking up the items, I went to my mother's bedroom on the first floor to share the good news, but she wasn't there. After searching every corner of the house and not finding her, I eventually went to the living room upstairs. Entering the room, my mother-in-law noticed me and smiled while intoxicated. Oh, Wendy, what's up? Her face was flushed with alcohol. Despite it still being daylight, she appeared to be intoxicated. Are you going out? Greg had come home from work and was relaxing in the living room, enjoying a drink while still in his work clothes. The usually tidy second floor living room had been a mess these past few days. The table was cluttered with empty cans and leftover dishes. Although I've told my in-laws to use the third floor, they spent today on the second floor again. It seemed the promise to find a place to live was just empty words. They haven't even attempted to go out. I approached Greg, who was relaxing in the living room, and asked him to talk in the hallway. Why don't your parents go up to the upper floor? Greg simply replied, because their legs hurt. But the second floor is my family's living space, and my mom. I said, to which he retorted, you want people with sore legs to climb the stairs? It would be better if your mother moved upstairs. Arguing with Greg is always difficult. In the brief exchange, I grew tired and shifted the topic to inquire about my mother's whereabouts. What? She went to a net cafe? I was surprised at Greg's answer. I couldn't agree with what Greg said. Yeah, she said she's going out with friends. Your mother is quite modern and youthful, isn't she? She's good with computers too. She might return by tonight. He praised my mother's youthfulness, but I couldn't imagine her going to a net cafe. It wasn't strange for my mother to use a computer, as that's a daily occurrence. However, I couldn't find a reason for her to specifically go to a net cafe. Then I realized that the computer my mother usually uses is a desktop located on the second floor. Since it's not a laptop, it can't be carried around. Can't we really give the second floor room to my mom? I implored Greg again. The second floor has important family items for my mother and the computer she uses daily. There's no TV in the first floor bedroom to entertain her and she must be at a loss for how to spend her time. Greg answered in an annoyed manner. My parents are here because they have sore legs. Your mother understands, so there shouldn't be a problem. But I counted. How can you say there's no problem? This is the Owen family's house. Why should my mom be displaced while your parents relax here? Greg seemed unable to understand my feelings. My mother went to the net cafe because she undoubtedly felt she had lost her place in this house. The excuse of going out with friends was likely just that, an excuse. I internally surmised that my mother said that out of consideration for Greg, but he seemed to take her words at face value. You always think only of your own parents. My parents aren't familiar with this area. They can't easily meet their friends. Your mother has friends nearby, so it's good for her to go out during the day, or she can just go to the third floor," he shouted in anger. Facing Greg's unprecedented rage, I was at a loss for words and felt my feelings for him cooling rapidly. Even in the face of his anger, I remained surprisingly calm, realizing that living together with him was no longer possible. Unable to respond, I could only leave the house. Before going out to pick up the items, I visited the city hall. In the evening, I went to my mother's room on the first floor and handed her the key to the rented storage after her bath. Keep this key for now and store things here when necessary. Eventually, we'll move dad's items back to the storeroom. I told her. My mother listened quietly, placing a gentle hand on my shoulder in encouragement. Wendy, you shouldn't mistreat his parents. 
I don't know when I'll leave this world, and after I'm gone, you'll only have them as family. You're not strong yourself, and you might need their support in the future, she said with a calm smile, but I could only shake my head. After my father's death, I was deeply disappointed in Greg's behavior and my desire to sever ties with the inconsiderate in-laws grew stronger day by day. I took out a document I had received at the city hall from my bag and spoke with determination. I'm considering a divorce. When I told this to my mother, she quietly, yet carefully, observed the divorce papers. After a few minutes of silence, my mother sighed and started a new conversation. Your father never took a single penny from you two. What he wanted was for you to save for the future. But that wasn't the only reason. This was the first time I heard such a story. My mother whispered to me, careful not to let her voice leak outside the room. After we're gone, we want you, who is physically weak, to be able to stand up to Greg on equal footing. It's best if you can get along, but life is unpredictable. Even if you were to divorce, we made sure this house would be yours. Having your own home means you can survive, right? You can manage with the government's support and your income. My mother smiled warmly, then her expression suddenly turned serious. So, divorce, huh? She said while picking up her smartphone. I had heard a faint vibrating sound since we were talking about the storage, and it grew louder when she held her phone. Looking at the screen, she tilted her head, observing the continuous notifications from the same social media app. As I tried to comprehend what was happening, my mother, looking pleased, said, we've become a topic of conversation. A few days later, in the morning, I handed the divorce papers to Greg. So, you want to divorce if things don't go your way. That's fine, let's divorce. But I'll sell this house, Greg declared, snatching the divorce papers from me. However, him selling this house is impossible because it's in my name. The house, initially in my mother's name, had been transferred to me, considering the future. Ah, uh, if I hadn't married you, I could have had children. His insult no longer affected me, knowing the situation Greg would face. Don't regret this. I told Greg calmly as he mishandled his things and sulked. Huh? Just then, the intercom rang. Knowing my mother was at the entrance, I didn't respond and left to do laundry. Please come this way. I heard my mother's cheerful voice and the footsteps of several workers coming up from below. Greg must have gone down to the first floor to see what was happening. Soon, I heard Greg's frantic voice and my in-laws shouting. My mother had arranged for movers to transfer my in-laws' belongings to my brother-in-law's house. What are you doing, mother? Why are you doing this without asking? My mother, as if waiting for this moment, cut off Greg's protest with a firm reply. You did things your way, didn't you? When Greg threw away my father's belongings, my mother, thinking about my future after she was gone, chose not to say anything. If you're going to divorce, there's no need to endure anymore. My mother declared and decided to swiftly evict my in-laws from the house. While Greg tried to stop the movers, he received a call. Huh? News. On the phone, with his smartphone pressed to his ear, he hurriedly turned on the TV. The call seemed to be from a friend, judging by the conversation. The TV showed a morning program reporting news based on information from social media. What? Is this about us? Greg was shocked to see our house's photo on TV. I never imagined my mother had been venting her frustrations on social media. I remembered the night I talked about divorce a few days ago. We've become a topic of conversation. She showed me the screen of the app, now featured on the DV. My daughter's husband is causing trouble. We might lose our house. My mother's post, starting with this statement, garnered many likes and retweets, eventually attracting a major newspaper's request for an interview. Although my mother had no intention of giving an interview, she replied and cooperated when she learned of my decision to divorce. As I watched our house on TV, my mother whispered beside me, now Greg won't be able to stay here anymore. Her face was full of vitality. I watched Greg, who was panicking about the workplace finding out, with a cold gaze. The power of the media often exceeds expectations, spreading information rapidly and prompting people to investigate everything from the homeowner to the exact location. This wave of reporting could lead to unforeseen outcomes. Our family's experience is just one example. Later, photos of Greg, my in-laws, and our family were published online, bringing significant changes to our lives. He acted swiftly, submitting the divorce papers and leaving the house with his belongings. That might have been his way of resolving the situation. After his departure, our house finally regained peace after a long period of turmoil. My father's cherished items were safely returned to their original place in the storeroom. Now, my mother and I live quietly and peacefully. Of course, I consider the possibility of being alone in the future, but even then, I hope to cherish and protect this house, grateful for my parents.
This house, inherited from my parents, is more than just a building. It holds memories, love, and family bonds. For me, this house is a precious place connecting the past and present, a symbol of hope for the future. That's why I feel it's my mission to care for and protect it. I've planned a trip to Cancun this time. Huh? A trip to Cancun? Hearing my mother-in-law say this with a smile, I harbored doubts. Despite being burdened with a huge debt and struggling to make monthly repayments. Why travel abroad? Moreover, despite the fact that I send money every month. Why is she going to Cancun alone? I absolutely cannot accept this. This is no joke. As I raised my voice in anger, my mother-in-law looked puzzled. Yes, this was all my husband's scheme. I was shocked by the certain truth revealed by my mother-in-law. My name is Amy. I am 35 years old, working as a regular employee at a general company, living an ordinary life. Five years have passed since I married Kevin. We had been living peaceful days without any major problems. However, suddenly a great trial appeared before us as a couple. This series of events was triggered by the recent death of my father-in-law. My father-in-law was a man of few words but gentle in nature, always caring for us as a couple. Thanks to him, I felt naturally integrated into my husband's family. That's why I couldn't accept his death. One evening, a little after his funeral, when things had calmed down, my husband suddenly started talking at dinner. Hey Amy, it's weird to talk about this all of a sudden but, is something wrong? Actually, I've been thinking about starting to financially support my parents' house from next month. Support? Why would you do that? Since my father passed away, I think my mother is struggling on her own. Wait a minute. I quickly interrupted my husband. Your father's passing is sad, but your sister is living in your parents' house, right? Yes, that's right, but my husband has a sister living at home. She works for a prestigious company and earns much more than my husband. My father-in-law had also worked for a well-known company until his retirement. The retirement money should be with my mother-in-law. On the other hand, we, as a couple, work for small to medium-sized companies. Our income is probably lower than the average for our age group. In such a situation, I couldn't understand why we needed to send money to my mother-in-law. Kevin, I don't think your mother and sister are struggling with money. So why send money? When I asked this, an unbelievable answer came back. Actually, it seems rich on the surface, but my mom has a considerable amount of debt. What? My mother-in-law has such a huge debt. Yes, it's hard to believe, but it's true. But you know, for some reason, she hasn't told my sister about the debt at all. That's why I brought up this idea to somehow help her. But what about your father's retirement money? Actually, it seems that most of it went to his hospital bills, surgery costs, and funeral expenses. So now, my mom is really in a tough financial situation. That's a really difficult situation. Yes, it is. That's why I know I'm asking a lot, but I really want to help her. Seeing him bow his head deeply, I was torn. My mother-in-law had helped us, as a couple, many times before. While I was looking for my current job, she actively took over all the household chores in my stead and often came to cook dinner. Moreover, when my husband changed jobs and we were short of living expenses, she secretly gave him money. I was always full of gratitude for her kindness. And every time I thanked her, she returned with polite words of gratitude. Thanks to her support, we had overcome many difficulties. Now that she was in trouble, I couldn't just overlook it. Considering the favors we had received so far, I strongly felt the desire to help her. With those feelings, after a little hesitation, I eventually agreed to my husband's proposal. From that day, to support my mother-in-law financially, we became stricter about saving. We were not living luxuriously in the first place, but still, we simplified our meals even more and switched to cheaper items for daily use. My husband started working late every day and came home late at night more often. And then, an incident occurred during these days. Perhaps due to accumulated fatigue, I developed a fever and fell ill. When I was preparing to go to the hospital after calling in sick to work, my husband said, Wait a minute, 
Are you really going to the hospital? Yes, I am. Just a fever, isn't it? There's no need to go to the hospital for a mild fever, especially when we need to save money. What? I was surprised by his words, but managed to argue back. But what if it's a viral fever like the flu? We have fever reducers at home, right? Just take those and rest, you'll get better. Going to the hospital is a waste of money. That's not true. Listen to me. No matter what, don't go to the hospital. We're saving money, remember? After hearing those words, I had no choice but to rest at home and ended up being bedridden for three days. Since then, my distress towards my husband gradually began to increase. Months later, to check on my mother-in-law's well-being, we visited my husband's parents' house. As I stepped into the living room, clothes and travel bags were scattered everywhere. Um, were you in the middle of sorting something out? I asked, and my mother-in-law replied with a beaming smile. Oh, actually, I'm going to Cancun this time. A trip to Cancun. Yes, that's right. Sarah said she would come with me. Amy, how about you? Do you want to come along? Really? As I was surprised, my sister-in-law, Sarah, next to me started clapping her hands with joy, saying, that's a great idea. Wait, what is this? We've been sending them money, and they're happily planning a trip to Cancun. This can't be happening. Without noticing my speechlessness, my mother-in-law and sister-in-law continued to excitedly talk about the Cancun trip. I'm so excited. It's my first time in Cancun. My mother-in-law said, and Sarah replied, me too. And it's surprisingly affordable this time of year. Exactly, Amy. Don't worry. If you can come with us, we'll cover the travel expenses. My mother-in-law continued, really? We've been so grateful to you ever since Kevin got married. Added Sarah. Unaware of my feelings, they were engrossed in their conversation. Finally reaching my limit, I confronted my smiling mother-in-law and sister-in-law, who were inviting me to the trip. Stop joking. A trip abroad. What are you really thinking? I raised my voice. What? Startled by my sudden reproach, my mother-in-law and sister-in-law froze with their mouths open. Even though they were shaken, they tried to calm me down. Amy, what's wrong? Did we say something odd? Maybe you don't like traveling? Did we invite you too forcefully? It's not about that. How can you even think of inviting me on a trip? Do you understand our situation? Amy, calm down. What caused you to be so angry? Really? If you have the means to go on a trip, I'd rather you pay off your debts first. What? Debts? I let all my feelings out towards them. We can hardly save money, and even when I'm sick, we can't afford to go to the hospital, yet we prioritize sending you money. And yet, how can you calmly plan a trip abroad? Please consider our situation a little. After pouring out all my emotions, I noticed tears streaming down my cheeks. Whether it was anger, sadness, or both, I wasn't sure. However, I was certain that the frugal lifestyle until now had been more painful than I thought. While crying, I collapsed on the spot. Seeing this, my husband rushed over in surprise. Hey, you. What are you saying to my mom? But, but, that's enough. We're going home. Kevin tried to pull me up forcefully. At that moment, my mother-in-law spoke up quietly. Wait a minute. What debts are you talking about? What? But didn't you have a huge debt? Surprised by my response, my mother-in-law's expression changed. There's no such thing. There's still my husband's pension and inheritance left. And I wouldn't be able to go on an overseas trip if I had debts. What? But... In that instant, I realized the full picture of the situation. Anger welled up inside me. The reason why my husband's income didn't increase despite his daily overtime. Why I was the only one getting thinner and sick, despite the strict savings. And why my usually polite mother-in-law never thanked us for the money we sent. Then, I faced a shocking truth. The need for sending money, as my husband had been saying, was actually a fabrication. There was never a need to send them money. I could have gone to the doctor immediately when I got sick. I would have realized it if I had thought about it a bit more. Realizing this made the pointlessness of our past frugal life evident. But in our financially tight life, 
It had been hard to make a calm judgment. My mother-in-law and sister-in-law on the scene seemed to realize the truth behind my husband's words. They looked at Kevin with a doubtful gaze. Kevin, what's the meaning of this? Amy says she was sending money because you had debts. What's all this about? Kevin was clearly looking for an excuse. No, it's different. Actually, how is it different? Explain it clearly. Make us understand, talk properly. Um, well, I could see that he was still trying to control the situation. My love for him had completely faded. I confronted my confused husband directly. What's all this about? There were no debts for your mother or sister. Where did all the money I gave you every month go? He began to mumble his words. Well, um, don't lie now. Tell me everything. Uh, the truth he revealed was something I found hard to accept. Actually, I was invited by a colleague and ended up going to nightclubs. You've been going to a nightclub? Yeah, well, how should I put it? I just got carried away without realizing it. I can't believe it. Going to such places when it hasn't been long since your father passed away. And that was around the time you started talking about sending money, right? I'm sorry, really sorry. I just went there for a bit of a change of pace. I didn't think it was a big deal. Such an excuse can't be accepted. How can you behave so irresponsibly? Lying about sending money and using my hard-earned money for going to nightclubs. I can never forgive that. No, it's not like that. I never meant to hurt you, Amy. I just got a bit carried away, that's all. I really regret it. As I shouted, my husband tried to appease me, piling up lies. But trust once lost, even but when husband and wife, is not easily regained. His impromptu lies and insincere attitude completely extinguished my love for him. No matter how long his apologies continued, I couldn't forgive him in my heart. I couldn't bear it anymore. I felt it was impossible to continue living with someone who lied to satisfy his own desires. With despair welling up from the depths of my heart, I told my husband my final words. I'm fed up. Saying I didn't intend to hurt you is no joke at all. Not only did you deceive me with lies, but how much do you need to belittle me? While I had a fever, you forced me to save money and enjoyed yourself in nightclubs? Unbelievable. Sarah's voice of surprise echoed in the background as I continued indignantly. I've been saving hard for your dear mother. Food, daily necessities, clothing. I've been enduring it all. Do you understand that effort? I can't even think of you as a family anymore. Such a scumbag should just go to hell. Just wait. I only went to nightclubs. Just that? The drinks you enjoyed with the money saved while I was sick must have tasted great. No, it was for work. I don't want to hear it anymore. I'm leaving. Wait, Amy. Please, I need you. What? Now? Have as much fun as you want in the nightclubs and see how it feels. Don't say that. By the way, I want all the money I gave you as support back. Make sure you pay it all back. Realizing the situation, my mother-in-law and sister-in-law hurriedly showed a posture of apology. Amy, I'm really sorry. I can't believe my foolish son did such a thing. It's truly shameful. Because of my thoughtless brother. Mother, Sarah, please don't apologize. It's not your fault. No, we have a responsibility too. We want to make amends somehow. Amy, I'm so sorry too. My brother has caused such trouble. Don't worry about it. But I've decided to divorce. I'm truly grateful to both of you, but please let me say goodbye. They nodded while shedding tears. Mother, Sarah, thank you for everything until now. At that moment, my husband called out to me with a pained voice. He knelt on the spot and continued to make excuses. Amy, please forgive me. I really regret what I've done until now. Before I could react, Sarah moved first and slapped my husband across the face. As he stood there stunned with a swollen cheek, Sarah looked down at him and said, I can't believe you would do something so terrible. How much more did you need to torment Amy? Sarah, lying to Amy to take the money meant for supporting the family, not allowing her to go to the hospital, and on top of that, spending that money at nightclubs. How can you be so heartless? I'm ashamed to be your sister. 
Wait, just hear me out. What's the point now? The fact that you've been forcing Amy to save and suffer for these past few months is true, isn't it? Mom and I will never forgive you. Never associate with us again. Do you understand? Don't ever show your face to us again. My sister-in-law, holding back tears, possibly dragged my husband out and threw him outside. She locked the door and cut off all communication with my husband. No matter how much he pleaded at the entrance, the door was not opened. Amy, I'm really sorry. There's not much I can say now, but forget about that man and find happiness. With those words, I was hugged tightly by my sister-in-law. After expressing my gratitude, I left my in-law's house. Then, I moved out of the house where I lived with my husband and found a new place near my workplace. Since I was already employed permanently, I didn't face much difficulty in living even after the divorce. I consulted a lawyer I knew to proceed with the divorce. It was clear that my husband was at fault, and the divorce was quickly finalized. I claimed the money he fraudulently took from me as support and the resulting compensation. I made sure to collect the maximum amount. He ended up having to pay the compensation in a lump sum and is now living days incomparably harder than before. I hear he is consumed with endless overtime and working through the night. Naturally, he no longer has time to frequent the nightclubs he used to enjoy. Now, he's just an existence who works. After the divorce, I received several messages from my ex-husband. I was wrong, forgive me. I'm not going to nightclubs anymore. I don't want to get back together. I'm just really in trouble. Can you lend me some money? Please, you're the only one I can rely on. In the end, it's all about money. I feel nothing but pity for him. Now that all the payments are finished, I'm thinking of blocking his contact. Meanwhile, I still keep in touch with my mother-in-law and sister-in-law. They worry about me and have been in regular contact even after the divorce. Just the other day, seeing me having regained my spirits, my mother-in-law showed tears. Amy, I'm so happy to see you doing well. Mother, don't worry about me. I can live on my own strength. I always thought you'd be okay, Amy. But remember, you can always rely on me and Sarah if you need anything. Thank you so much. Let's go to Cancun together next time, just the three of us. Of course, I'm looking forward to it. If it weren't for the support of my mother-in-law and sister-in-law, I couldn't have overcome the trial of divorce. Since they always wish for my happiness, I vow to live my life with all my strength.